What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview, the number one podcast in the industry for real estate agents to learn how to get shit done. Make sure to check us out at www.gsdmode.com to check out other GSD Mode podcast interviews and other additional free content, free webinar trainings, and more epic content that I'm always putting out there to help real estate agents like you crush your real estate goals. Just a few quick plugs before we begin. If you are a driven real estate agent that has big goals, big dreams, and want to create greatness, then check out my personal mentorship coaching program at www.90daymastery.com where you can see how it works, what you can expect, see a ton of testimonials about the massive success other realtors just like yourself have experienced with the program, and learn why thousands and thousands of real estate agents have decided to join my personal coaching program to help them change their business and life forever. All right, so is real estate agents Hands down, by far, the number one most important tool in our real estate business is our CRM. If you want to use the exact same website and CRM I use that provides you with all my personal follow-up drips that allows my team to generate thousands of leads each and every month and close two-plus homes every single day, check us out at www.perfectstormnow.com to see the best, most effective, and affordable website CRM system on the planet. If you are going to sign up, make sure to go to perfectstormgsd.com. You want to make sure that you go there and register, perfectstormgsd.com, where you can get the registration free waived and only pay $199 a month. All right, one last quick thing. Your support truly means a lot. If you find these interviews and any other GSD Mode content powerful, please make sure to share it with anyone that you feel can benefit from this content. All right, it is time to jump on into today's GSD Mode podcast interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview, where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate agents, and strip top badasses out there dominating their space. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for others, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, you guys got another rock star guest on the show. <clears throat> so our guest uh, was a former Fox News anchor uh, for the number one cable news show in the world. Um, uh, but during his career, he was also in the behind the scenes going out there and, and, and investing and building wealth and building passive income. And once he built up enough passive income uh, to exit, he left the, 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 the network, if you will, um, um, and went and continued this, this passion, this journey of his, of creating more financial freedom, but as well as going out there and now coaching and helping so many others go out there and create financial freedom in their lives. So really stoked and honored to have Clayton Morris on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I think we're going to my goal today is to try to bring as much value to your audience as I can. So I'm excited to get into it, man. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked too, man. It's, you know, before, before we you know, hit the record button off air, you know, we we're talking about, um, you know, the real estate agent, right? Which is, is our listener base. And the scary part about real estate is, you know, yeah, you've got this business, but, but really it's, it's, it turns into a high paying job for most and there's no exit strategy and you know, there's no 401ks and, you know, uh, um, and if agents aren't intentional, I man, I see it all the time, you know, right? Let's just say an agent's, you know, 75 years old, they decide to be done selling real estate. They, they right. take down their license, pack up their box, nothing to sell at the end of the day. They pack up their desk in a little box and, and they leave. And, and there, there's no end game for them unless they're, they're very smart and intentional, which unfortunately very few are. So, you know, I, I'm really excited to get into that because I, I know our, our listeners. Yeah and, you know, go out there and, and, and really learn some great tactics to go out there and create wealth and fi financial freedom. And that when you have passive income, man, it alleviates so much stress off your plate. Yeah. Right. Where like, sometimes like you need this deal to close to pay your mortgage so bad that maybe you get blindsided from looking out for your client's best interest. Right. Um, right. But as well as, man, this is such a wealth of, of knowledge that we can go out there and, and help our clients with on this journey too. So, before we get into all that, man, I'm always intrigued in our guest journey that led them here in the first place. And like, you're a dude, like, all right, you're, you're on Fox news, you know, globally, man. Um, um, you got this like dream position for so many people. 
you know, most I, I'm, I'm imagining a lot of people when you left, like, what, what do you mean? Like, why would you like, right. why would you leave that, <laughs> that transition? And, and if we were on the clocks, man, like how did this journey start and what led you to, to just making that decision? Well, it's funny. I was actually back on Fox last week or right before the holidays because it, my, our new book had just come out, How to Pay Off Your Mortgage in Five Years. So they actually invited me back. And I retired at 40 years old from television, like you said, on the number one morning show in the world on Fox and Friends. And I was the, you know, one of their main anchors. And people, I, I went into the green room last week and I was saying hi to all these people that I hadn't seen in so long, like Bill Hemmer and Judge Napolitano and all, and all these people that were, that are mainstays of, of the Fox News channel. And, and they're like, they're like, so and one, Stuart Varney from the Fox Business Network came up to me and he said, so few people, he said, I've never seen anybody do what you did. And he, and he was, and I was like flattered by this. He said, it took balls. He's like, you, you he's like, you, went out there and as an entrepreneur and you, you gave up one of the most coveted positions in television, in the television business. And when he said that, I had just done my segment with them. I just like looked over at the couch where I used to sit and I was just like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. What have I done? You know? And it's like, it was sort of a pinch, pinch me moment. But I think at the heart of it, you know, I grew up as a, you know, as a kid, I used to sneak downstairs and, and would love to watch Letterman and Carson and I wanted to work in TV in the broadcasting business. I just loved the medium of broadcasting, you know, to be able to tell my story. And, and so I just, that's how I kind of grew up in this business. I, I, my first job out of college was as a producer, as a production assistant out in Los Angeles at Good Day LA. And then I moved around the country, put it, you know, paying my dues, you know, making no money, like $23,000 a year in Helena, Montana as a as a, a CBS reporter, a political reporter covering the governor, and then to West Virginia, then Virginia, then Ohio, and, you know, all over the country. And, and this sort of journey unfolded for me where I was constantly renting from other people, you know, and I got to Fox 29 in Philadelphia, my home city of Philly, back home. And I was anchoring good day Philadelphia. So here I am in the number four market doing really well, I'm, you know, 29 years old, they encouraged me to buy a house and you know, in Philadelphia and great. They're running promo ads during Eagles playoff games. And I'm getting ca phone calls from high school friends. They're like, what you're going you know, to be anchoring, you know, and good day, Philadelphia. What the heck? And I got there and a week after I got there, my news director was fired. The woman that had hired me, she hired me to make the morning show fun and hip and young again. And then she gets fired. So now I have no internal support. And they hire a new news director who wanted to make it all like violence. And that's what he, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And it just didn't gel with me. So nine months into my contract, my contract is up and available and I'm, they can renew it or not. And I thought for sure they're going to renew me. You know, they encouraged me to buy a house. I'm living. And no, they just called me up to the office and the general manager said, we're not going to renew your contract. We think you were sold a bill of goods. We want to take the show in this direction and you were brought in to do this. And I said, Oh my God, I'm out of a job. And I flash back to being 12 years old, watching my dad, it was his job, working for somebody else, you know, a paycheck employee, a W-2 employee. He was downsized. And I remember him pacing around the kitchen and I was terrified at 12 years old that, oh my God, we're going to lose the house. To your point earlier about paying a mortgage, oh my God, how are we going to pay the mortgage, right? Because you're beholden to somebody else. So I lost my job in Philly and I vowed right then never again am I going to be beholden to somebody else paying my salary and being reliant on that as my only method of income. Um, I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to do it, but I understood that real estate investing was a really smart way to do it. So that was sort of the, the first seed of it being planted right there, that moment where I said, I'm going to be like a dog like a, with a bone and I'm going to go after it. And when I got them the job, the, the network called me and said, hey, we have an opening on our Fox and Friends morning show. We'd love you to come up to the network, come up to the New York City um, near 30 Rock and, and meet with us. And I said, wait a second, didn't you guys just not renew my contract in Philly? It's Fox, isn't the same company? And the network said, no, you know, we're, we're it's a big separation between church and state. We don't care what the local affiliates do. We've been watching you for a number of years and we'd like you to come up here. So I was flattered. They brought me up, they hired me. And then 10 years later, working at the network, um, I decided to retire. And the whole time I was at that network, I was starting to buy real estate, starting to buy, you know, residential properties 
for passive income, building up my own safety net so that I could achieve, you know, financial freedom. And that's kind of the long sorted tale, but it's funny because on my YouTube channel last week on Morris Invest, our YouTube channel, we published, I published that video of my appearance on Fox. And so many people who watch my Morris Invest YouTube channel have no idea that I was ever on TV. So I got people in the comments below the video like, oh my God, you were on TV? Like, so now I get to like talk to people like you do with your podcast and your audience directly talking about helping people build passive income and they don't give a rat's behind that I was ever on TV, you know, interviewing presidential candidates. So that's kind of the long, crazy journey. Yeah. It's, it's so amazing sometimes in life of, cause I'm guessing when they delivered that news of not, not renewing your contract, you're like, well, man, I just bought this house. Like you're, you're, yeah. you know, I mean, it's a, this yeah. insane, you know, freak out level panic, but it's, it's crazy how those can be some of the, like, when we think in one moment, it's the worst moment in our life, how it becomes the biggest blessing. Cause it, like, how would your life have changed if that never happened and everything just went status quo, you know? Right. Oh my God. I, you're right. I mean, cause I, I would have probably still been in Philadelphia for a few more years. I would have never then gone to the network. I would have never been forced sort of out of my comfort zone. And, you know, like I was talking to my son last uh, this morning about something and he was going to go to the ski camp today. Um, we're up here in the mountains for the holidays and he was going to go do that. He was nervous. He didn't know any of the kids and he was nervous. And I said, you know, unless you're uncomfortable, you are not growing, right? If you are comfortable, then guess what? Game over. Life's over. You're done, right? Why be here? We're only here for a short amount of time and it's to be uncomfortable and to grow as a result of being uncomfortable and being challenged. And you know, the people, right? The people, the, the whole reason you have this great podcast is because the people that, you know, kind of go into that beast mode mentality and are like a dog with a bone and they're going to go out and get it. That's what separates those people uh, from the people that are just mediocre, who never want any kind of conflict in their life. They don't want any challenge. And guess what? They're going to be sort of resigned to a life of mediocrity. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it, man. So then, um, all right. So, so that happens, you get this great new offer, but you had committed at this point to never or do everything you could to not allow yourself to be vulnerable in that position again. Right. I, um, but I think a lot of people like, now they're like, Oh, well now I've made it. I'm on national TV and, 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 you know, what are global TV, you know, whatever, uh, um, where they, they may have like people forget pain very quickly. Where, where right. It was like, Oh, well shit. Now I don't need to go down this journey. But like, then what was the next step? Was there a pause? Was there a break? Or was it like, how did you stay, you know, in that, that financial freedom mode with this huge new opportunity? Well, a couple of things happened right before I lost my job. Um, I, I had gone through the crash of 08, you know, 07. And so I did some flips when I lived in Orlando, Florida. And took that money and rolled that into a speculative land project in North Carolina that went belly up. Um, the builder backed out, the contractors, bat, it was a whole, you know, it was a golf course community. It just never happened. And I was on the line for all this money for it that I put up. So I lost all of that, right? Then I had it went through a foreclosure. My credit was destroyed. So like one of the things I talked about on Fox last week when I was a guest again was, look, you know, yeah, you're sitting at home thinking, Hey, you know, he's got this cushy job, right? Because he's sitting here on this couch on national television. Uh, but what you didn't realize is I couldn't even go to the commissary and buy coffee. One morning I went to go buy coffee, use my debit card, and it was, wasn't working. I was like, what's going on? It's a debit card. Like, it should come right out of my account. My account should be fine. I'm making a great salary here at Fox. What's happening? And I had a deficiency judgment that was leveled against me because of this, you know, North Carolina land project that went belly up and my, all my accounts were frozen. My credit was, you know, under 500. So I had no credit. I had no money to speak of. Uh, I couldn't get a loan. And so it, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't like all pleasure cruise, you know? Um, so I had to then start from scratch really. And I said, okay, I, you know, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure this out and I've got to be able to leverage all of the resources that I have at my disposal, you know, pulling money from my 401k, um, all of these different things. And so I just started to slowly kind of put those things in place, but you're right. Like you get cushy, right? Cause like, Oh, now I got this good salary. I got this good money coming in from this good job, but I'm, you're only as good as your most recent contract. So in the TV business, you sign like a two to three year contract. 
Well, guess what? You start to get sweaty on that second year because now you realize like, okay, they could not renew my contract again as it comes up for renewal at the third year mark. And guess what? I'm out of luck and I'm right back where I was in Philadelphia and I'm out of a job again. And I'm only as good as your most recent contract. It's like in, you know, real estate agents, flippers, you're only as good as your most recent flip. Because guess what? You better have stuff in the pipeline. Otherwise, what? What's next? You better be, you better have a really strong pipeline and a plan. Do you want to not eat during the holidays because no one wants to move? No. Guess what? You should have some other things in place during the Christmas time so that you are putting food on your own table. Um, and that's, that was sort of my mentality. It was, I guess, you know, a lot of ways it was a fear-based mentality. Like I am not going to go back to where I was in 2009 when I lost my job in Philadelphia. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. So then, all right, dude. So where you, where you were at there, I think is such a epic place to really transition into how you did it. Cause it's like most people are maybe starting out at zero. You were below right. zero, like you were <laughs> yeah. way beyond zero. Right. So, yeah. So, so, you know, cause I think a, for a lot of people that don't invest in real estate, the, the reason for most is like this limiting belief of, of, you know, that they don't have the resource, they don't have the assets, they can't, or it's going to take way more money than maybe it does or, you know, right. So, um, kind of walk us through, you know, how you go from, you know, you talked about pulling money from phone and just getting very resourceful to pull this stuff off, you know, right. so, um, um, and like where you got your start that way, those that are listening can you know, get some ideas of, of how to get theirs. So I think one thing to remember, let's just lay some groundwork here for people, uh, you know, who are listening think, think that you're fine. You're just, you're, 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 you know, kind of like, I don't know, copacetic right now, right? 50% of all Americans wouldn't be able to come up with $2,000 in an emergency. Yeah. That's who wants to be at that spot. Right. And what, what does financial freedom truly look like? Most people throw out sort of arbitrary numbers, and what I talk about, you know, my podcast and what I do on our website is you have to figure out what your financial freedom number looks like. And you have to understand what that means. So you say, you say to somebody, John, what, you know, how, what would you, what kind of money would you like to make? Well, I'd like to make $2 million. Why? It's such an artificial, random, meaningless number. But what if we figured out, first of all, what your monthly expenses look like? And then what your why is. So let's figure out how much money would it take for me to be financially free every month? Maybe it's $4,000. You add up your mortgage payment. You add up your kids, you know, your, your kids soccer camp, groceries, Netflix. What does that look like every month? And take the average of six months. Is it typically right around $4,500 a month for you to live? Great. Then what if we could get enough passive income from real estate that would produce that monthly cash flow that would enable us to live financially free? You don't need $2 million. <laughs> you need a safety net that's built upon passive income and cash flow from assets. You're putting assets in, the, you know, you're in your performing asset column and you're getting rid of liabilities. See, most people have this assumption about wealthy people is that they're, you know, surprisingly, most wealthy people are actually not financially free because they live their life. Their lives always expand to meet their paycheck, right? So they get more in a paycheck than their lives expand to that. So when I would get raises at Fox, one of the things that I made sure that I did um, was always pretended like I never had that raise. So as you make more money in your position, put that money away into an account that will allow you to purchase rental properties. Okay. Pretend like you never even got that raise because what will happen is you will start accounting for that extra $200 a week in your salary and you'll start to just, you know, go out to eat more often and all of that money will be gone. You will not be make, moving any closer to financial freedom by just spending that money. But there are all sorts of things that you have at your disposal now that you probably don't even think about. Number one, you might have a 401k plan, right? You might have a military retirement account. One of the first ways that I bought rental properties was borrowing from my 401k, not withdrawing from my 401k, but borrowing from it and allowing me then to take that money and buy a performing asset. Because let's be honest, 401k is fairly worthless. I mean, the average 401k retirement is $90,000, according to Time Magazine last year. The average 401k retirement is $90,000. So you retire at 59 and a half years old, are you going to be able to live off of that $90,000 for the rest of your life? No, no way. So use that money that you've got in a 401k now as the bank of you. You borrow from it. 
you're then paying yourself back with interest. You're then buying a performing asset and you're then growing and you're building your net worth and your monthly cash flow. So take that money and borrow from it and start making 800 bucks a month in cash flow from a $50,000, $60,000 rental property, which is what I do all day long. Um, that's just one way. You might have, a, you might have a, you know, an IRA that you don't even touch. Roll it over to a self-directed IRA. Leverage that. Loan that money out to a house flipper. If you're a real estate agent, you know house flippers, and they are constantly looking for private money. So let's say you, have tw- you, want, to grow, you want to grow some money really fast. You've got $20,000 sitting in a, in a retirement account, an IRA that you're not doing anything with it. Roll it over to a new, a new custodial account. Uh, like Advanta IRA is really good. Um, who else? Sense Financial, really good. Uh, Equity Trust Company. They're all, they'll set up your self-directed accounts, right? Very, very minimal fees, almost nothing. Then you now have the power, that checkbook control of your IRA. Lend out $10,000 to that house flipper who has to, you know, needs to raise money. And lend it out at a, a, you know, a 12% interest with a six month, you know, a note attached to it. So in six months, you're making, a, you're making a 12% return on that money. Before you know it, that account grows to 50, 60, $70,000 and then buy a performing asset with that. So you just got to start thinking, getting your mind creatively thinking. You're going out to local real, uh, real estate meetup groups, right? Go to meetup.com. Make those connections with other real estate professionals in your area and don't be the fly on the wall. There are that's where the magic happens in those local meetup groups. Put on an aim tag and don't stand in the corner. Get out of a, a, a pen and every business card that you're handled, handed by one of those people in that room, write a note down about John. John does this. He's a house flipper. He does this. And then the next day, call that person. And that's how you start. That's how I started to do it. And I started doing hundreds of deals in Northern New Jersey because of that, because of those connections I was making. And before you know it, you're doing deals left and right. You're building passive income. And you can, I mean, there's so many different ways to geometrically grow this, but those are just a few ways that kind of come to mind right off the bat. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many uh, real estate investors that I've, I've spoken with that, you know, got their start in those real estate media groups, you know, right? Cause I mean, it's like, look, we all have pain and problems. When you're right. broke, you have money problems. When you're when you're wealthy, you have money problems, right? So so you know, there's always those solutions to be able to go solve the problem, right? Where like, right, they may not have the time. Well, you can go out there and you might have the 30 hours a week extra to go invest and, and get cut in the deal, and then you know, right? Uh, um, so yeah. then with that though, dude. Of you know, you talked about the getting clear on the why, and, yeah. and you know, I wanted to see if you could elaborate a little bit more on that because it's like, look. When you talked about okay, most wealthy people don't have financial freedom because they keep expanding it, you know, right? Like you got to be very clear on, on why it's so important and why you want it. It comes down to the whole, you know, never sacrifice what you want most for what you want in the moment, you know, because if you're playing the keeping up with the Joneses game and you know yeah. you're not willing to go through that pain because it's like you might be making half a million dollars a year, but having to live like you're only making a hundred. Well, everybody else, all your friends in your income bracket are buying lavish houses and whatever and like, like, you know, yeah, be a little bit of a hit, but if you're clear on that, why? So can you talk about like, how do you get clear uh, on that? So you're willing to go through that pain to create that financial freedom. Yeah. I think you bring up a great point, which is that these people that you see these wealthy and these, these quote unquote wealthy people, right? I, I love this. I think I just posted this on my Instagram the other day. Like, you know, can you, can you figure out the wealthier person? And it was a picture of, you know, a really lavish, you know, six bedroom house, you know, with a really fancy car and they have a $1 million mortgage and they have no money in the bank, you know, or the person that doesn't have a mortgage uh, is not like in this crazy lavish house, uh, has no debts and has, you know, $10,000 in the bank. You know, who's the wealthier individual there? Well, look, if you are a slave to that mortgage, you are not wealthy, right? The home you live in is not an asset. And if you can start to really change your brain around this idea of the home that I live in is not an asset, then you can start to really put things in in motion as well around buying performing assets and, you know, even educating your clients about that as as a real estate professional. Um, I just want to say that because I think it's so important what you bring up about this idea about kind of keeping up with the Joneses, you know, what we, what we think are wealthy people, chances are they're not, 
they're highly leveraged um, and they're li- they don't have any cash flow. They don't have any performing assets. You know, it's active income. They're sort of living off of active income, W2 income. And they don't have any passive income. And that to me is true, true wealth building is having that legacy wealth and passive monthly income. So if we start there as the foundation, um, back to the why, you know, this is a really important point because so many people chase after money and they, they have no idea why they're doing it. And most people have no, you know, most people have no connection to their core and, and what their motivation is. Have you ever tackled a project? Um, I'm sure you have Josh. Like, you know, you go after a project because and there's no, you don't really, you're not paying attention to the money side of it, but you're just, you're so engrossed in this project because it just speaks to you in some way. Right. And you don't care about, well, how can I monetize this? You know, how can I turn this into a paycheck? And it's those things you'll just sit up for hours working on something on your iPad or drawing something or building something, or you'll be out in the shed pounding away, build, you know, building something with a hammer. Right. It's because you, you found something that speaks to you. And so I say that when people come to us, when we have clients come to us at our company at Morris invest and they're like, um, yeah, I want to, you know, I think I want to do this. I think I want to get a, you know, invest in this or maybe commercial property or maybe billboards or maybe mobile home parks. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's the how. That's the easy part, right? The how. But what, but where, where's your why? Why do you want to invest in real estate? Is it because, and these are some of the questions you really need to write down and think about. Is it because you spend two hours on the road every day on your way to work? And you know what? That's two hours you don't get to spend with your kids. Now, I have friends that work in Manhattan. I don't work there anymore because I retired. But they don't get home till like 7.30 at night. By the time the train gets in from Manhattan, they get home. They're tired. They pour themselves a cocktail. Their kids are going to bed. They don't even get to see their kids, right? So is your why that you don't want to ever have to get on that train again? And you want to be able to see your kids grow up. That's a why. Maybe you've got a sick relative, God forbid, who you didn't get to spend much time with in your formative years, but now they they're really need your help, and you would love to be able to sit by their bedside every day over the last year of their life and, and, help, and be with them, right? That's a why. Um, maybe you saw your father lose his job as a slave to a paycheck when you were growing up and you vowed you wanted to give and teach your children the power of financial freedom and passive income and be around to educate them in a way that you were never raised. You know, we were never taught these things in school. Um, it doesn't have to be incredibly profound, but there has to be some sort of a compass point for you knowing why you want to have monthly passive income coming in. Um, and once you are clear with that, why, then the goal becomes simple, right? Then it, it's not about chasing after some random number. It, you have a goal now. It can be right up on your, on your wall. I, I just knew that I never wanted to be sweating about when a contract was coming up again. I never wanted to repeat what my dad went through, always being sort of a slave to a, a boss. I, I, I just knew I didn't want that. I knew that I wanted to live without that anxiety in my heart. Um, and I wanted to live knowing that I've built up my own safety net the, the, because of the work that I put in. So we all have to find that why before we worry about, oh, I'm going to invest in mobile homes or single family homes. That's the how. That's the easy part. Figure out your why first. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, man. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was talking with a buddy of mine the other day that he was making more money than he's ever made in his life. He's making he about half a million a, a year now. And he's like, man, I've lost that motivation. I've lost that, you know, that zest, that drive. And, and, and I'm like, well, why are you doing all of this? You know, right? and he's like, well, to take, like, provide opportunities for my kids, provide opportunities for my family. And I'm like, all right, man, think worst case scenario. Like you and your wife go on date nights and I get hit by a semi and you guys are dead. You know, right? Like, are your kids taken care of? Are they set up the way that you want for the things that you want to provide for them? You know, paying for the college, paying for the weddings. Like, are, are, they, are those things in place and taken care of and funded? You know, uh, um, and the answer was no, you know, right. Um, and I'm like, well, dude, like you haven't taken care of your kids. You haven't done your more right. obligation as a father to take care of your family. Yet. Like get your ass to work, you know, right. Um, right. I don't think right. people deal in those realities. Like, you know, you, you brought up a stat of, of, you know, some of the wealth that are just the statistics that are out there. It's scary. You know, you look at right now, only 2% of Americans at the age of 65 or older can retire without being reliant on the government or social security. So it's like, well, do I want my parents to, to have to be taken care of by the government or do I want to be in a position to be able to help them out and support them? 
You know, right. I got to take care of my family right now. Then I got to take care of my wife and I for the future and, and, and didn't do those things, you know, for, for our kids. And, you know, when people, we start breaking it down, man, I don't think people think and know how much money it truly takes to go out there and, and truly fund life and get through this life. Right. Right. Because, you know, the, the epiphany for me was here I am at Fox News. I, I hadn't quite figured out the formula yet. And I get on this flight to I take, take some time off and go to New Zealand um, to shoot photos. My friend is one of the great photographers of the world. and he, he lives on the South Island of New Zealand. He invited me to come for a few days and I could only get off a few days of work. And so I, I, I travel there and I'm on this flight for 16 hours. And I wish I would have talked to the people earlier who were sitting next to me. But after 16 hours, we're on our descent, you know, into Queens, Queenstown. And they said, oh, you know, how, they were in their like 50s. And I was, you know, my early 30s or so. And they said, um, how long are you going to be in New Zealand? I said, oh, I'm going to be here for like five days. I got to get, you know, got to get back to, to work and the kids. And, and they said, oh, and I said, what about you guys? How long are you going to be in New Zealand? And the, the guy looks at me and says, oh, we're going to be here for two months. And I said, two months. I said, what can you, what do you do that you can go to New Zealand? You're not retired. What, what do you do that you can go to New Zealand for two months? He's like, oh, I'm a real estate investor. I said, ah. And the bells just went off in my head, you know, and I just picked his brain about like where he was investing in the Midwest and buying single family homes and go focusing on return on investment instead of uh, falling in love with real estate. And like I, everything he taught me like a week later when I got back was immediately the way I bought my first property. And I've never looked back and I followed that exact formula to success. And, you know, so his, your point is well taken is like he was in New Zealand enjoying his life and what he one thing that stood out to me that he said to me was i'll be here but my properties that i buy with my partner will be produced like i'll still be paid while i'm here so i was like wait a second so wait a minute you'll be in new zealand and on the first of the month there will be like direct deposits put in your account from tenants and properties and assets that you own wow no people don't understand this like that's how you build true financial freedom. And that's how you build legacy wealth for your children is that you could be in St. Andrews playing golf with your son and back home, your rental properties are putting cash flow in your pocket. Uh, and that's, that's, that to me is how you build true legacy wealth. Yeah. Well, man. So then, all right. So let's just say that, you know, somebody gets clear on their why and, and understands and knows that, that they need to do this, you know, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, would you recommend, though, because you talked about like with a 401k or a self-directed IRA, um, you know, would you recommend, let's just say I'm a real estate agent and, and you know, I'm making 150 grand a year, 200 grand a year or whatever. Um, and I don't have the, the money to go actually, you know, buy an investment property where I'd be able to cash flow yet. Uh, um, would you recommend then start like funding a self-IRA? Maybe they, get, they can have three grand a month that they could spare to start dipping into there to then let that grow to a point where then they can borrow against that as you talked about, or like, like how, what is the most strategic way that you would recommend for them to get started with this? Well, I think, first of all, I think your audience is in a unique position and the, I'm so, I'm really, really surprised with the real estate agents that I meet in this business who literally do not understand investing at all. They service the retail buyer right? The, the open house, the staging of a multi, uh, you know, $1.2 million property that they're going to make a big check on. But the investment part of it, they just simply don't understand. So I am, I am friends with a lot of real estate agents, a lot. And one thing they commonly say, and these are people who, you know, have come through the, the ringer and now are figuring out investing. But they're just like, look, we just don't often know what to do with a property that we come across that's in disrepair, we, we can't list it. So we just tell the, we just tell the seller, you know, I don't know, but we, I don't want to take that listing. It's just too much work. Right. And so I think your audience is in a unique position. Uh, one thing I spoke to a large group, a couple hundred um, investor or real estate agents a few months ago. And one of the things I said to them is, you know, you guys are finders. You have the opportunity with all of the resources at your disposal in that office to be finders of incredible deals. Deals are hard to find, right? So you have deals coming across your desk of things that you might not think you can do anything with. Start looking at it as an opportunity for you to pick it up. 
you have your mortgage brokers that you work with. You have these different individuals. It's not so hard for you to take this great deal that maybe needs a little TLC that can be turned into a great rental property and to work with a local bank, you know, put 20% down, 25% down on this investment. If you can't come up with, you know, you're buying a $60,000 rental property, you can't come up with, you know, 10, 15, 20,000, uh, in, that you have and at your disposal, put it, like you said, put three grand aside on a regular basis, like every few weeks before, you know, you've got enough for that down payment in these areas where, you know, comps, right? So you understand that this is going to, this is a nice deal because it's already, you've got 20% equity in it, or you've, you know, you've already got a nice chunk of equity in it because you're buying it for 60, but it's worth 90. So then immediately refinance that and pull that money all the way back out. Now you've got an infinite return on that investment. Now you've got none of your own money in the deal. That's how you start. To me, that's how you start. Then you just snowball it from there. Now you've got this one property that's fully cash flowing, and then roll that money that you've pulled fully out again, roll that into the next property. And before you know it, you've got 15 properties and you've got financial freedom. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, most real estate investors, a lot of them that you've probably never even heard of, you know, multimillionaires, they never went to college. They just followed that simple formula. So you can use it any number of ways. Yes, you can use a part of your 401k. You could use a part of that retirement account for your down payment. You could use, you know, you just have to talk with your accountant to make sure that like, okay, if I take this out, I actually, if I take it out of the, the retirement account and I'm going to get that 10% penalty, is it worth it on my taxes this year to do it this year and enable you to buy a performing asset? Well, if the 10% penalty is there, but you're making a 12% return, I would do it. You know, I would take that 10% penalty if I'm making a 12% return this one year, because next year that 12% then is all gravy. And you're not going to get penalized 10% every year. So you got to start playing with those numbers a little bit, but I just think real estate and real estate agents are finders. Now it's time for you to be a keeper. Stop making everyone else rich. You know, stop making all these other people rich. You're in the driver's seat as a real estate agent. Like my wife's a real estate agent. She's a real estate agent for us. We don't have any clients we service. We don't do open houses. We aren't list doing any listings. She's a real estate agent for us as our company. And she's a real estate professional. So as a real estate professional, the tax benefits of her having her own business and the way that we've structured our business with those 750 hours a year that you have to prove to the IRS, you work as a real estate professional. We're in a whole other tax bracket thanks to that. So as a real estate agent, you are way ahead of the game and you have an opportunity to be a keeper of these amazing deals instead of making everyone else wealthy. Yeah. Well, and then kind of back to your earlier point of, of the meetup groups, you know, right. As real estate agents being a finder, like you, if you, you're, you, if, if you're intentional with this, you are going to connect with somebody that just does not have the time you know, that, that's, yes. you know, willing to, to partner with you on a deal. And I, I had a gentleman on the podcast not too long ago that in five years, you know, um, um, he built a $50 million portfolio, uh, um, you know, a syndication. Um, you know, he's like, look, I start off like, you know, I'm getting 5% or 10%, you know, here and there. And it, it, as my credibility, you know, got, got better, it got more, you know, but it was right. getting that expertise and just starting to get in the game and, and, you know, and, and it snowballed into five years to a $50 million portfolio and it's growing from there. And, you know, there, there are so many ways where it doesn't need to cost you any money. You've got, you've got, you're coming across the deals. You got the time. Yeah. Right. And you can, you can get that start. And by the way, you know, people think, okay, well, I can't, I have no money. Well, look, okay. There's three things you need. You have people, deals, and money, right? If you are a real estate agent, you have access to deals. Okay. So there's, those are three things that you, you need, right? But, if you're an investor, you really only need two of the three or one of the three if you're trying to play this game. So when you're starting out, you may not have any money. Okay, so you have zero dollars, but you have the deals. You're a real estate agent. Go to the local meetup groups, find the people that can get you the money. So maybe you have the money, right? Great. So you're sitting back, you've got a lot of money, but you have no deals and you don't know any people. So that's how you become a connector. You go to these local real estate meetup groups like you're talking about and you become a connector. Hey, I, I get great deals that land across my desk all the time, all the time. You do? I'm looking for a good deal. Okay, great. And you know what? 
you're able to then leverage that. You're bringing this great deal to somebody. You know what? I want to keep, I want to keep a certain, I, I want to keep an equity position in this property. Okay, great. Maybe you partner with somebody you met at a meetup group. You do a 50% equity partnership in this property. You know, it's a great deal. And then he's like, well, I've got a partner who's got money. Great. So now he brought the money to the table, you brought the deal, and now you've, you've got a 50% split on this property. So that's how it all starts. But so for some people, you know, it just depends on how bad, badly you want it. I just knew I never wanted to lose my job again. And when I told my wife, this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to figure out real estate investing. I don't think she ever realized that we would, you know, like we would build a company where we're doing, you know, we do 6 million a year. And I mean, and the properties we do, like, it never occurred to her that that was when I first said, I'm going to figure this out. But she said to me the other day, she said, you know, when you, you become like a dog with a bone and you just go after it, nothing will stop you. So it just depends on how badly you want it. Do you just want one property and you're okay with that? Every year you pick up one property or do you want to get there in five years and you want 50 rental properties within five years? You can do it. It just depends on how badly you want it. You can do it. People do it all the time. So it's just a matter of taking action to get it, you know, get it across the finish line. Yeah. Love it, man. So you, you said earlier that, you know, it's important to understand that your home isn't an asset. Um, and, and, you know, I had a, a Grant Cardone on the podcast and, you know, he's on the camp of like, you should never own, you rent and then, you know, invest that money. And, and I don't know if it's a, um, did I lose you? Okay. Just, okay. Uh, um, Sorry. Yeah. Just a call came through. Sorry about that. Okay. No, you're good. Um, you know, so, and, and who knows, man, I might have a, a, a block in here from, you know, being 15 years of being a real estate agent, um, you know, where it's like, look, there's a price point where it seems to, you know, you, but you could own for cheaper than you can rent and, and it would make mm -hmm. sense. And, and so when you, can you just kind of elaborate on that? I mean, should people, you know, cause I mean, most people in real estate are following Grant Cardone, you know, right. Um, um, and I get where he's coming from 100% uh, uh, as well, especially with the type of property he's living in. Um, you know, right. but, but would you recommend man to, to, uh, um, like, in, like, let's say I want to get started investing. Should I go out there and rent if I own sell that house, um, or, or use that extra money to invest in actual rental property assets or, or, you know, what's your belief system there? I think we are, I think we've been so beat into our heads for decades that owning a house you live in is the American dream, right? It's the American dream. You work for a good company, get a good, you know, good salary, W-2 job, put money in a 401k and buy a, buy a house. I'm telling you, not telling you, I'm telling the audience that assets only put, you know, performing assets, put money in your pocket every month. So when you make the argument that, oh, my house will appreciate, well, you cannot eat that equity. So my house will appreciate or it's going to appreciate. So I'm buying it for 300,000 and it's going to be worth 400 in 10 years. Great. So now that massive down payment that you took to put down on that property is a down payment that you could have used to buy three rental properties that are producing $800 a month in cash flow. So we can get emotional about it. Look, I own the house I live in, but I'm telling you if I could do it again, uh, and I would, <laughs> we're actually, we're actually in the process of selling it right now because we're going to use that money and reposition it. We own it, you know, we own over 50 rental properties, but we're going to take that money and reposition it into performing assets. And we're going to rent because I said, look, we're, we're not walking the, we're not, you know, we're not walking the walk. We, we bought it because we live near Manhattan, but I'm telling you, you know, a home of that, of that caliber where you're putting down $200,000 down payment or a hundred thousand or 500,000 or 400,000 doesn't matter. Whatever your down payment is, that's just money. You're, you're kind of wasting. I mean, in many ways, because you're not then turning it into performing assets. You could take that money and buy eight rental properties that are now performing every month in cash flow, and allow then rent the place that you want to live in. Right. And I know that's not practical for everyone because when we say, well, what happens if two years we find this great place that we love, we want to kind of put down roots and the landlord just says, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to sell the house. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to rent it out anymore. Great. There's some options, seller financing, right? You could talk to the landlord and say, well, you know, we love this house. Would you consider doing seller financing on that, on this house? 
and he's a smart investor, he would say yes, because he doesn't have to pay capital gains all at one time. Right. So he might say, yeah, I'd love to have that. Let's do a 30 year note. We'll spread out my capital gains pain over 30 years. You can still continue to rent the house, you know, rent to own, to live in the property and do it that way. There's so many other ways to, to do it. But I just think people want to argue about this because they, I, I, there's some sort of emotional decades long attachment to this idea that the house you live in is the American dream. And it simply isn't. It is the property taxes, the pain of repairs, the, all of the stuff that you are on the hook for in the house that you live in. Um, it, you're, it's not putting money in your pocket every month. It's taking money out of your pocket every month. I talk about this on our podcast, which is, okay, maybe turn it into a performing. How do you do that? All right, well, take a home equity line of credit out on it. So if you do have $100,000 in equity now, it's still sitting there doing nothing for you. So you can't eat equity. It doesn't put food on your table. Take that 100000 and buy two $50,000 rental properties. Yeah. Now that produce $800 a month, now you've got $1,600 a month in cash flow because of the equity that you leveraged from your, from your, your primary asset. So that's how I feel about it. And, you know, I know people just get so defensive about it. Now, my parents included because of, they're of that generation. But you can't, I just feel like you can't argue with it when, when, the, when the main basis of it is an asset puts money in your pocket every month. And my house doesn't. It takes money out of my pocket in the form of a mortgage. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah, 100%, man. And, and you said earlier something of, of, you know, how to pay your mortgage down or off within five years. So maybe somebody yes. is like, like one of my, one of my best friends in, in, in the real estate space is, you know, a very, very smart, savvy investor. He's like, I'll never buy again. You know, got a hit and his wife got pregnant and, you know, the emotions kicked in and they want their own backyard. He's like, well, then I went out there and, and bought a house. Right. Uh, um, you know, uh, so, you know, those people that are, want to own for whatever reason, emotional attachment, whatever, um, you know, kind of elaborate yeah. on that of, of. Yeah. I mean, so that, that, well, I mean, I'm glad you bring this up because I had, I had somebody from a real estate trade group reached out to me because of the book. We, um, you know, it's been fortunately, and thanks to the people that, that bought it, I hope it helps because we, my wife and I wrote it and it's like no fluff. We cut right to the chase in it. It's like a hundred pages. You'll read it in one night. Um, on how to pay off your mortgage in five years. The new edition addresses the 2018 tax code and everything. Um, but I had a real estate trader organization reach out to me from real estate agents and said, look, we, we want to be able to give, we want our agents to be able to use this, to be able to give out to their clients. And I was like, holy smokes, that makes a lot of sense. That makes more sense than anything. I, if you think about it, if you're a real estate agent, so we had this, this group, they bought like a couple hundred copies of the book and they're starting to give them out. So if you're a real estate agent, um, instead of giving them a gift basket, you know, uh, your client, when they close on the property, give them a book, give them a book on how to pay off their mortgage in five years. Cause now you help them get this property. What if you could also give them this tool that would help them pay it off in five years? And guess what? They're probably going to come back to you and buy another property more quickly <laughs> as a result, right? They're going to be able to come to you and say, Hey, I'd like to buy an investment property. You got anything, you know, they're going to become that's how that, your book of business, right? Your Rolodex of clients is your best source of leads. Your current crop of clients that you've serviced and helped buy a house uh, or help sell a house to, they're your, are your best repeat customers. So the how to pay off your house in five years strategy, we, we go through multiple strategies in the book. Um, but one of the ways we talk about is leveraging a home equity line of credit. And we walk you through sort of step-by-step step how to leverage, use your home equity line of credit to fire multiple payments at your principal balance of your mortgage. Um, it, it, there's a term for it that's lately come into fashion called like velocity, velocity banking. Um, but it, it's, it, it's, you have to structure it very intelligently. And that's how we teach you to do it in the book, which is to make sure that your, your two biggest enemies are time and interest. And so what you're doing with using a helm equity line of credit is going after both of those with like a sword. Okay. People say, well, what about that? Just if I make one extra payment a year, no, that helps a little bit. But again, what you're still doing is you're still paying the interest portion of your loan. What we teach you to do is to go right after principal and we teach you really how to educate yourself on what's in your mortgage. Number one, that's sort of the beginning of the book because most people have no idea. They don't know the fees that they're paying. They don't even understand, well, you know, all of, if you break it down, it kind of makes you weep a little bit. We teach you about those things that are in the mortgage. And then we teach you the different 
tools at your disposal, home equity line being one of them, 401k being another. Um, we teach a bunch of different strategies in the book to kind of go after that principal balance. And we've done it multiple times. And we've had so many people write to us now who've employed this strategy um, over the past two years and have paid off their mortgage. And it just, to me, that's like the greatest gift in the world <laughs> is hearing from people that read the book, did it, and are now debt free and are able to start thinking about building passive income by buying rental real estate now, you know? Yeah, no, I love it, man. So wh where's, uh, um, where's the best place to go get the book? Is it on Amazon or do they go to your website? Yeah, they can come to my website if they want, but it's on amazon.com. If they just do a search for how to pay off your mortgage in five years, you'll see two copies. One is a blue cover. That's the new edition for 2018, 2019. And then the older one, still a good book, but it's not been updated so it's been completely rewritten from the ground up to address the 2018 tax code and all of the changes there. Um, so that's all in the book as well. Um, so Amazon's the best place. Paperback. Oh, and we're on Audible too. So we got an audio book okay. version too as well. Cool. And those that are watching, listen, we'll have a link right below to, to make it super easy on you. So, um, you know, man, all right. So, you know, I, I see so many uh, 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 people like yourself that go out there and, and have a lot of success in something, you know, right. Um, and, and, it seems to never be about the money, but it's like, Hey man, I, I, you know, I figured this thing out. Now I want to share this, you know, mm -hmm. gift that I discovered with others to have the same impact that it's had in my life um, and go out there and create programs. And, you know, so not only are you investing, but you, you have, you know, a coaching program and, you know, other things there where you're teaching and, and a lot of people to go out there and change their life. Like it's changed yours. You know, like how did that all come about and kind of talk to us about, you know, what that looks like. Well, we just did a soft launch. Thank you for asking. We just, we just did a soft launch of what my wife and I are calling the Financial Freedom Academy. Um, and so sort of by invitation only through, through our email subscribers, and, and we've kind of been mentioning it casually um, as we've launched soft um, to work out any software kinks and all that. But and people can check it out at financialfreedomacademy.com. But we, we launched it because my wife said, if I could, if we could build something that took 15 years of our knowledge, and if I had this 15 years ago, I would be so far ahead of the game if I had access to this 15 years ago. What could we build that would help people create financial intelligence, to learn how to understand their balance sheet, or understand the difference between liabilities and performing assets? Um, you know, I had someone write to me and say, I want to take the course. And I have like these 30 questions. I, 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 should I start an LLC to buy real estate? Should I do this with my taxes? Should I do this? I'm like, all of those things will be answered in the course. Like, yes, you, this is exactly for that type of a person who wants to, it, it's all of the things we were never taught in high school, right? We were taught to balance a checkbook in high school. If you're lucky, that's about it, right? This is all, if we could take all of this and give this as like a seventh or eighth grade class, could probably change. I hope it, you know, would like change so many people um, because it helps them, you know, create financial freedom and creating financial intelligence. And it's not just around real estate. We really, you know, we really teach you how to be incorporate your family, how to leverage, you know, your a self directed IRA, how to lower your overall taxable income by, you know, bringing your family into the business. Um, and structuring things the way that we do with our LLC and holding company and all of those pieces to help people create financial freedom. So that's really what the, the course is all about. Um, it's about helping people, you know, go to that next level and, and, and put it all in one place. So it's like nine modules. Plus we, um, we give away the book as well. And with a bonus module on how to pay off your mortgage in five years. So it's all, it's all in the, uh, all in the financial freedom Academy. That's awesome. And so then, um, yeah, and I do, I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you look at it or, or those that are watching and listening, you know, right. It, it helps us in our own personal lives, you know, right. With that also education that is so critical that we can transfer that value to our clients, you know, but you brought up such a good point of our kids, man. It's, it's like the education system is so broken and it's so outdated and, you know, right. I mean, how do we educate our kids properly, um, you know, on this stuff and, so then with that being said, I know you said that it's a soft, like you have the soft launch going on. Um, like when, when is it going to be available? Um, like, is there a link that we can go to and check it out and purchase it now? Yeah. And I'm happy to give you a link that you can share with your audience. Um, 
so you can share and invite this crowd um, and who, anybody who wants to sign up, that would be wonderful. Um, we've got a private Facebook group just for Academy members also. So Natalie and I go live inside that. We'll do live shows where we'll do question and answer and help people through paying off debt, all of those things. So yeah, happy to give you a link that you guys, you can share and, and link it up here for anyone who wants to sign up. That would be great. Awesome. Yeah, we'll get that from you. And then again, right below, guys, will be a link for you to link on that. Um, um, so you can uh, definitely check that out. So I know we're going long on time here. So just a couple, couple of real quick questions uh, sure. um, before we wind up here uh, or wind down. Uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, in, 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 and this isn't about necessarily real estate. This is about building our, uh, our building our businesses, right? Um, you know, and, and, and a lot of real estate agents are, are finally, you know, kind of waking up to the power of media, you know, right. Of you know, things like, like Gary Vaynerchuk has talked about for so long in, in business and with your media background, you know, what are some of the ways that you've been able to, you know, kind of leverage media to grow your own business and some things that you've learned that you would recommend other entrepreneurs to really leverage. Cause then it's so, I mean, with our cell phones and, and with YouTube, it's all free to do, you know, right. right? Um, well, I think, it, 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 well, Gary V scares a lot of people. Like, and um, I was in his office like last week or oh, I don't know, a week and a half ago. And I've, I've known him for like 11 years, 12 years now. And, you know, I've seen him grow before he ever wrote the first book, you know, crush it, you know. Um, and it, because he's got a whole team. So when you watch like his content on Instagram or Twitter or YouTube, whatever, he's got, you go up to his office, he's got like 10 people on his like social media team. You don't have to have that. Okay. Um, it would be great if you had that, but you don't have to have that. And I think one of the things that Gary talks about, which is so important is, you know, create and catalog. Okay. So if you are somebody who has done some interesting things this is one of the things we're working on for, for the new year is, you know, our, our company and we've, we've done thousands of deals, you know, we've flipped like thousands of homes and cataloging that people ask us in our YouTube comments, like, could you walk through like a typical property, how this happens? It's like you have the opportunity in your profession, maybe you're a real estate agent and you are, you know, you are in one particular town, right? You are in Applebee, Wisconsin. I'm making up a town. Maybe there is an Applebee, Wisconsin. I don't know. But you have an opportunity to own that town by, by you know, starting your own YouTube channel, specifically around Applebee, Wisconsin real estate, you know, and being in the face of that, you're going around to different neighborhoods, you're showing off like I, this area, the school is growing, this is a great area. You have an opportunity to, to really niche down. You don't have to be Gary Vaynerchuk and global. You can be Applebee, Wisconsin and own Applebee, Wisconsin as that real estate agent, right? And you can do a YouTube channel that talks about the benefits of this school district versus that and why this river has flooding problems in Appleby, Wisconsin. So I might not buy a property near here because you're in a flood zone. You could literally sit down with a spreadsheet and I guarantee you, you could write down 100 ideas, 100 different topic ideas, okay? You could write a blog as a real estate agent and you could write 100 topic ideas, you know, on why you should avoid houses between root. 10 and route 12 because of flooding problems or high crime, you know, and then do a video on it, embed that video right in that blog post. Um, then go live on your Instagram feed, you know, and, and talking about Applebee, Wisconsin. So you know, it doesn't have to be global and massive. Just start in one channel. So make it YouTube, right? So, in, you know, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So behind Google, Google owns them. So when someone's going to Google and thinking about buying a house in Applebee, Wisconsin, wouldn't it be great if your videos as John, the real estate agent, were the first to pop up? I know a, a guy who did this in the insurance business. It's kind of what started me to create the Morris Invest YouTube channel a few years ago. He, upstate New York, was an, he was a 22-year-old kid with his family insurance business. You know, just a normal insurance business in upstate New York. He decided he was going to do 100 videos about insurance for on their YouTube channel. And he created a YouTube channel and he answered like 100 insurance questions. And he tagged it as Johnson and Johnson Insurance Company and had links to be able to like buy insurance with his family's company. It exploded his family business because when someone was going to buy insurance in this part of upstate New York, who do you who do you think came up first on search results? simply because he put in the time. So, and that's all free. I mean, it takes time and hard work, 
but you're not paying for advertising. You're not paying for park benches with your name on it for real estate agents or billboards. You're building Google organic traffic by, you know, by leveraging YouTube as a social media platform and it's free. And, you know, most people start their real estate journey on the internet first, right? They do a search. Like right now, my wife and I are looking for a property that we're going to go uh, rent. Um, and I'm just doing tons of internet research to, you know, reaching out to, <laughs> to find it. I'm starting there. I'm not hitting the pavement. So that's the way to do it. I think not to be scared about it, but there's so many great tools, but pick one or two channels. You don't have to do 30. You don't have to do Snapchat. You don't have to do all this other stuff. Just focus on one or two areas where you're going to put the most time and attention. And I would say YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's so it's it's so powerful because it's like all right, we can all jump on a Zillow app and and as the consumer and find any properties, right? So, right. But what's impossible, like anywhere you go, is to truly find out what lifestyle is like in that area. Like when you're talking about having to do all that research on the flex place you're going to go rent, man, that is difficult. It's difficult to find what what local businesses are there, what those schools are like. I mean, it's you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's such a you know easy play, and then with you Google Chrome extensions, man, you can go see the keywords people are typing in as they're searching and create the content around them and you know, get out your iPhone and shoot it. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you do, if you just go to your, to your great point, if you go to Google and just type in Appleby, Wisconsin, um, I don't know, real estate for sale. I mean, that's a pretty broad keyword, but, or, um, great area, you know, uh, parks, parks in Appleby, Wisconsin, right? You could write a, and like, you could see the search results that like Google auto fills as suggestions that pop up. And maybe there's like one that says like homes for sale near parks, Appleby, Wisconsin. Then maybe you own that blog post. You write a great killer blog post around that keyword search that popped up. Google is going to reward you because now mo when people search for that, guess whose article is probably going to pop to the top if you actually write a really good, solid article on your website about it. That's how you start to grow, you know? Yeah, yeah. awesome, man. Love it. So one last question for you before we, we end up here uh, um, or wrap up. Um, you know, knowing everything you know now today, if you could go have a conversation with your earlier self, um, and we can make it any point, you know, it could be the point yeah. of, your real estate starting career, or maybe you want to make it like, hey, 18, graduating high school. But if you could go back at any point in time, knowing everything you know now, and give yourself two pieces of advice to a younger version of yourself, what would those two pieces of advice be? Well, one of them would be that, you know, I've had a lot of fears in my life. And Clayton, as you grow, you're going to have a ton of fears, a lot of things that are going to really scare the shit out of you in your life. And guess what? None of them ever, none of them ever came to fruition, right? You're still alive and you're breathing and you're fine. Um, all of these fears that you think, you know, are going to cause you pain and all, you know, cause all kinds of problems in your life. They're all just figments of your imagination. They're all just created by your mind. They don't actually exist. And to be present, you know, you're always, you're always fine in the present moment. When you're laying in bed at, at midnight and you're worried about this thing from three weeks from now, why? You're cozy in your nice warm bed. That thing is three weeks away and it's actually not even real right now. It doesn't even exist. You know, you're worried about something that's not even there. So if I could teach my younger version of myself about like how debilitating fear can be, it's been one of the things that has like, you know, ruled my life. and It's been really, really difficult to overcome in my life. So that would be number one. And number two, would be about the difference between your higher self. Like we all, our higher self, we all know intuitively the right things in our life. And it's when our sort of thinking brain gets in the way that holds us back. So perfect example is this morning, my son is scared to go to the ski camp I was talking about, right? And I said to him, you know, again, son, unless you're uncomfortable, you're not growing. So the fact that you are nervous about giving that speech in front of a thousand people, you, that, that you're nervous, that's great because you're uncomfortable. And that means you're going to grow as a result of that speech in front of a thousand people. You going to this ski camp, the fact that you're like, you're not some, you know, cocky kid. Oh, I'm good. it's going to be fine. I'll love it. It's going to be fine. No, you should be nervous. You don't know any of these kids and you're a little nervous about it. But guess what? As a result of this experience, you are going to grow you are going to be stronger later this afternoon when you come home from this ski camp. You're going to be a different child than when before you went into that. So I think if those two lessons I could have known as a child that 
whenever I'm uncomfortable, you're probably on to the right thing. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I, I, I don't, I am that this piece of information, you know, if it's 100% true or not, but it came from a pretty credible source and it sounds true. Um, but it was, of I don't know, the, the, whatever the brain scan is to measure the, the brain waves or whatever. They're like nervous, the nervous energy wave and anxiety is at the same exact frequency. It's the same source, you know, right? It's just yeah. a perspective of, of how you shift that. And you look at so many people that are on drugs and whatever, just because of this anxiety issue. And, and, you know, maybe it's, you know, that, that, that's that growth moment that they're not choosing to not listen to and, and, you know, hide away from, I, you know, when you brought that, it just made me think of it. And yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, so true. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, it's our perception of it, right? It's our perception of this moment. You could have, you could have a really what you perceive as a big loss in your life, right? I, losing my job to your point earlier, you know, I could have thought that would have been the worst thing in the world. I was like walking around Philadelphia that afternoon, like, Oh my God, I just, my whole life is over, but it was actually the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know, I've been, I've had multiple experiences like that. Some really, really difficult hardships in my business and life, but I'm so thankful for them because I've grown as a result of it. Yep. Yep. Love it, man. So then I want to make sure that uh, everybody's got um, or knows the best way. And we'll have links to all of this, but we, you know, we have a lot of uh, people on iTunes, Stitcher that um, sure. uh, may not, you know, they're just listening right now. Um, where, where are the best places to go check out your podcast? Cause you got an amazing podcast. You got you know, your YouTube channel. You put out so much amazing free information, you know, as well as you've got the other programs out there. Like how do people get plugged in and start following? Yeah, I think the easiest catch-all place is where everything is linked up is just at ClaytonMorris.com. So if they just come there, we've got links to the podcast, links to the book, you know, how to pay off your mortgage book. We've got links to the Financial Freedom Academy. So if you're driving right now and you're not trying to take notes or anything like that, just come on over there. That's the best place. It's kind of the central hub for everything. And then, you know, if you're listening to the podcast and you want to pop over and subscribe and join us if you like podcasts, um, yeah, it's just called, it's a generic name. You'll never forget it. Super stupid name. It's just called the uh, uh, Investing in Real Estate Podcast with Clayton Morris. So we publish that three times a week to help you build financial freedom. Yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. And again, you guys that are watching us, we have links to all this stuff uh, uh, right below to make it super easy on you. And um, I know we end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly the start of delusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information, taking action on it, which then creates the power in your world for you to create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Clayton shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys. Uh, make sure that you take action on something you learn. Don't wait, go out there and take action so you can create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Clayton, man, this has been such, a, such an amazing time, such an honor. I know it's probably two days after Christmas as we're recording right for the new year and you're, you're on vacation with your family. Um, and the fact that you took this busy time away to, to be here with us, man, truly means a lot. This has been a massive honor. Well, it's been my honor and my pleasure. So thank you so much. And uh, it's good to be back to work, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. Love it, man. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.